So as I said, the uh, proteins are composed of amino acids that are linked together via peptide bonds. So you form a long polypeptide chain, uh, and then the R groups, which are the side chains of the amino acids, are, are protruding off the sides. So uh, if you just see these different amino acids and you look at the structure of proteins, hydrogen atoms account for around half of the atoms. Um, and as I said, they play key roles in protein structure and function. So that's really what I want to show you today. Um, so protein structures, three-dimensional structures of protein are defined by the linear sequence of amino acid residues, which is known as the primary structure. Um, there's some, been some interesting developments recently with um, these powerful uh, computer software programs for trying to determine the three di dimensional structures of proteins from their linear sequences, something which has really developed a huge amount over the last few years. When I was a student in Manchester University, I was fascinated by that, but I never thought in my lifetime I would see it happen. So that's, they're not there yet, but they're, they're getting close. So I just wanted to show you some simple details about protein structure first, because these emphasize why the hydrogens are so important. So when we go from the sequence of amino acids, this is just the sequence of amino acids in this fatty acid binding protein that I'm showing here. Um, this sequence of amino acids defines the three-dimensional structure. And, and what happens is the protein, protein amino acids uh, spontaneously form what are known as secondary structures, such as alpha helices and beta sheets. And they do this via networks of hydrogen bonds between the amino acids that are in close proximity to each other. So here is the alpha helices with the hydrogen bonding, and here is a, a beta sheet with the hydrogen bonds between the two chains. Um, just for those people that aren't um, biologists or uh, biochemists, uh, just because I'll show lots of pictures of proteins, I just wanted to explain that uh, an alpha helix is uh, depicted by these sort of uh, curly helices uh, in a cartoon sort of representation, whereas beta sheets are, are represented by these sort of arrow representations. This was Jane Richardson, a uh, fantastic scientist who uh, came up with this idea to uh, develop these sort of easier st uh, structures, ribbon presentations of proteins. Um, Okay, so just to mention that given that the amino acid sequence determines the three-dimensional structure and you have all these networks of hydrogen bonds between the alpha helices and beta sheets, any mutations in the amino acid sequence alters those hydrogen bond networks and that can reduce or enhance the pro protein's propensity to misfold or dissociate. And um, this is something which I'll speak about a bit later because this is related to amyloidogenic diseases. Okay, so another important aspect of hydrogens in, in biology is that um, small molecules, uh, small molecule ligands such as substrates, inhibitors, activators, carbohydrates, they dock in the binding sites of biological macromolecules via direct and water-mediated hydrogen bonds through hy hydrophobic interactions. So therefore, just showing here is the HIV-1 protease with uh, an antiretroviral drug clinical inhibitor bound in the active site. Now, these drugs and carbohydrates and all these smaller molecules, they all bind in their, in their binding sites through hydrogen bonding and through hydrophobic interactions. So for structure-based drug design, these details, the knowledge of the hydrogen atom positions and how the hydrogen bonding networks are in the binding site are crucial for, towards identifying ways to enhance drug binding and drug resistance. Um, enzyme mechanisms is an, a, an area that we uh, do a lot of work with neutrons in. This is because, um, well, just to say enzymes are biological catalysts. They increase the reaction rate by lowering the activation energy. Um, and almost all the processes in the cell need enzyme catalysis in order to occur at rates fast enough to sustain life. So again, in enzyme mechanisms, the hydrogen atoms and protons of amino acids and the waters located in the active site are directly or indirectly involved in the catalytic mechanisms. Therefore, details of the amino acid protonation states and the water positions and orientations and discrimination between H2O, OH- and hydronium ions are all uh, important and uh, information required for determining the correct catalytic pathway. 
Um, you might ask if we know the amino acid PKAs, surely we can just work out what the protonation states of the amino acids will be. Uh, that isn't the case because amino acid side chain PKAs can be dramatically shifted um, in, the, in, 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 in the micro environment of an enzyme active site. So here, for example, I'm just showing another protein carbonic anhydrase, which catalyzes this reaction of carbon dioxide and water to bicarbonate and protons. Um, it does this uh, without some, with the enzyme doing this uh, process, catalyzing this reaction, it's about 10 to the power seven times faster than what would occur uh, without the enzyme. So as you can imagine, um, this is actually one of the fastest known proteins, uh, enzyme, pro enzyme catalysis. And um, it's only limited by the diffusion rate of the substrates. So once again, understanding these enzyme mechanisms, uh, knowing the positions of the hydrogens, the protonation states, all of this is hugely beneficial for, for once you understand the catalytic mechanism, that can really be crucial towards the design of effective inhibitors or activators, uh, depending on whether we want to block the function of an enzyme or whether we want to uh, accentuate it. So um, that's all great. Um, and this is where neutrons come in because um, neutrons um, are really the only technique that can provide the positions of hydrogen atoms and protons in a, in a biological molecule at room temperature. Um, and the reason for that is because the ne neutrons are scattered by the atomic nuclei uh, rather than in the case of electrons where they're scattered by the, uh, sorry, in, rather in the case of x-rays where they're scattered by the electron clouds. So there is a different scattering strengths. The interaction is different. And it turns out that while x-ray scattering, uh, the strength of scattering is proportional to the number of electrons with uh, neutrons, the scattering strengths are on a completely different scale and show no correlation to the number of electrons. So for example, with hy hydrogen with one electron scatters x-rays very weakly. Um, and so it's really difficult to determine the positions on top of that, any, any mobility in the position of this hydrogen weakens the signal or blurs the signal that you get with X-rays even more so. And so it completely blurs it out. Um, this is a problem because even with ultra high resolution X-ray structures that can show the positions of some hydrogens, generally the most biologically interesting are those that are mobile and these aren't able to be seen with even with ultra high resolution x-ray structures. I think the highest resolution structure uh, is at 0.48 angstroms with x-rays and a lot of the water water positions and a lot of the mobile hydrogen atoms of the of the protein uh, were not visible even at that resolution. In contrast because the scattering strengths are different uh, neutrons uh, give us the ability to to visualize the hydrogens uh, or the isotope deuterium, uh, um, because they scatter at similar strengths to the other com common elements of the biological macromolecules. Um, one thing you'll notice, and I'm sure you all know this, is that hydrogen itself has a, a very large incoherent scattering, which just contributes to the background in, in, in crystallography and diffraction. And um, so it is actually preferential to substitute the, the, the hydrogens for its isotope deuterium, which has a much lower incoherent scattering, 40 times lower. On top of that, the scattering strength of the deuterium is approximately twice that of, of hydrogen and is actually a, uh, is a positive scatterer rather than a negative scatterer. And again, the fact that it's deuterium is a positive scatterer means we can avoid issues of uh, cancellation between a positive and a negative scatterer. So for example, in a CH2 group, often at the resolutions, the medium resolutions that we determine protein structures with neutrons at around two angstroms, there can be cancellation of information between the carbon and the hydrogens. So when we exchange the hydrogen for deuterium, we have two positive scatterers and we have no cancellation. And this is really actually super important for interpreting the, uh, the maps that you get from the, from the data. So I think I've just summarized that here. Um, so neutron diffraction data can provide us with the positions of the hydrogen atoms and also the protons, um, the deuterium atoms and the deuteron positions around resolutions of 1.5 
1.5 angstroms for the hydrogens and, and 2.5 angstroms or better for the deuteriums. So again, compared to x-rays where we need data at atomic resolution, subatomic resolution to start locating hydrogens, even at medium resolutions of 2.5 angstroms, we can locate deuterium atoms in neutron maps. Um, the most important thing is that these, these deuterium or hydrogen positions allow us to uh, visualize the hydrogen bonding within the proteins or biological macromolecules. Generally, I'll talk about proteins, but <clears throat> we have done studies of uh, oligonucleotides, um, different forms of DNA, um, and the same thing applies. The neutron data shows us the hydrogen bonding networks. It gives us information on the protonation states of the amino acids and gives us information on the water structure, which is intrinsic to a protein structure, where we can see not only the positions of the water molecules, but also their orientations. And as I just mentioned before, I, I'm not sure actually if I did mention, but this is a very important point, as well as being able to see hydrogens, neutrons offer us the ability to collect data at room temperature because there's no radiation damage, unlike X-rays and electrons, which are ionizing radiation and cause damage to the structures. So given that we're looking into biology, uh, the closer you are to physiological temperatures, the better. Typically, most X-ray structures have, have been determined at 100 Kelvin. And um, actually, there can be differences in structures between different temperatures. So uh, that can then have some issues with the interpretation. This is just some very nice uh, examples of some neutron data. Um, actually, this is from Biodiff. I thought I'd show something from another instrument as well. It's uh, very nice maps of a protein kinase where you can see, for example, the, uh, the uh, protonation state of a histidine residue. You can see the orientation of waters. You see this nice penta pentamer of water molecules, and you can see these protonation states of, for example, this arginine residue. Um, so um, that's all fantastic, but you might wonder why then no, what everyone doesn't just do neutron crystallography instead of X-ray crystallography. Well, the real challenge is that, of course, we have much lower fluxes, uh, much uh, lower intensity beams than with X-ray sources. So many orders of magnitude, even less than a rotating anode, never mind a synchrotron or an XFEL. So the challenge really is to be able to grow crystals that are large enough to compensate for the much lower intensity of the beam. Um, so there are various ways. I'm not gonna talk too much about large crystal growth, but there are various different techniques that can be used to grow larger crystals from simple things like scaling up, but also knowledge of the crystallization phase diagram and these sort of things to, to maintain the crystal in the metastable zone. Um, Things like counter diffusion can be used um, to grow large crystals. But one of the other ways to, to reduce the size of the crystals is, one of the ways to reduce the size of the crystal, sorry, is to, to um, fully deuterate the protein. Um, so typically, uh, the easiest way to exchange hydrogen for deuterium in a protein crystal is to just soak in or vapor diffuse deuterated buffers. Now this only exchange those uh, hydrogens that are attached to oxygen and nitrogen. Um, those attached to carbon will still remain as hydrogen. And so only around 15% or up to perhaps maximum of 25% of the hydrogens can be exchanged. It's much better to uh, fully deuterate the protein. And this, this requires the expression of, expression of bacteria, expression of the protein from bacteria fed deuterated media. And as you probably all know, we have a special deuteration lab as part of the life sciences group where they have expertise and know how in, in how to do these um, uh, special biochemistry techniques in order to produce fully deuterated proteins. Now, the advantage of that is that, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have a much lower incoherent scattering and we also re get completely obviate these issues of uh, cancellation. So that turns out to mean that we can use much smaller crystals with per deuterated crystals, and we, are, we have much easier interpretation of the maps. This is just um, a, a figure of uh, hydrogen deuterium exchange um, nuclear scattering length density map, where you can see the hydrogen peaks in green and the positive scattering in blue. As you can see here, there's no information for this hydrogen position. Of course, we know it's there, but the, the actual information has been cancelled between the positive scatterer and the negative scatterer. 
In the case of fully deuterated proteins, that issue doesn't occur, and we can see the positions clearly of all the all the atoms. Here is just some of the a little close-up of some of the diffraction, and you can even see in this that the background on the two patterns is much lower for the per deuterated form. It's not so easy to see that, but also the intensities are stronger of the diffraction spots. So this is crucial really, because it means that we can uh, use much smaller crystals in order to study larger unit cells. Uh, I've just put down some examples of protein crystals that uh, we've collected data, neutron data on. And historically, um, neutron crystallography, it was always said you needed crystals of multi-millimeters cubed. And this, this back in the, the late 60s up till the 90s was perhaps true. Um, it is no longer true for the most, the majority of uh, samples that we look at, unless the cell is so large that then you will still need a, a larger crystal. So uh, I've just get, an, you can get an idea of that from here, where if we have small molecular weight proteins, we can get away with very small crystals. I'd say very small, they're still large crystals, but very small compared to in the past. As you go up in molecular weight, of course, we need to still use larger crystals. Uh, this example here of the aspartate amino transferase, it's one of the largest cell studies with neutrons. It's 93 kilodalton molecular weight, and we used a crystal 0.65 uh, millimeters cubed. There's a really nice uh, publication by people from the D-Lab, Michael Hartlein, Trevor Forsyth, Juliet DeVos, Martin Milan, who, who wrote a, an excellent sort of summary of uh, all the deuteration uh, techniques that you use in, in the deuteration lab. Um, so when we've so if we manage to have crystals that are um, hydrogen deuterium exchanged or per deuterated, then we can that are of sufficient size. We can then try and collect neutron data. And the instrument that we've been doing this on for the last fifteen years or so, it, uh, ten years at least, is is LADI, which stands for Lowy Diffractometer. Um, basically. We have a neutron guide a cold, that supplies cold neutrons. These are the sort of wavelength ranges that come down the uh, neutron guide to the primary spectrometer where there's a nickel titanium multilayer bandpass filter, which basically selects out um, a wavelength range, a quasi Lowy or pink beam from the full white beam. So here you see the full white beam. Here you see the, uh, the wavelengths that we choose for data collection. Um, the reason we do that is because if you use the full white beam for each diffraction spot comes from a certain wavelength, but the background comes from the whole range of wavelengths that you use. So you have an issue with the signal to, your, to noise if you, um, if you use the whole white beam. Conversely, if you use a monochromatic beam, um, you stimulate a lot less reflections and so data collection can take a lot longer. Um, you, so it's a kind of a quasi Lowy beam is a compromise, let's say, between one and the other. Um, so we typically use um, resolution uh, wavelength, neutron wavelengths of around three to four angstroms. And we have a detector which fully encircles. So the sample sits in the center of this cylindrical detector. Um, and so we have a large coverage of, of, of reciprocal sp space, uh, greater than two pi steer Aden. Uh, which again, combination of the Lowy method with the cylindrical detector enhances data collection efficiency so that we can collect data quick, more quickly. Um, typically, uh, this is just to schematize the polychromatic nature of the beam, the crystal, and then diffraction spots uh, occurring on the detector from different wavelengths within the, uh, uh, the bandpass. We also have a cryo stream on the machine. Now I told you that we, um, we have the advantage we can collect data at room temperature and the majority of the structures that we do are at room temperature. However, there are some times where you want to collect data at uh, cryo temperatures at 100 Kelvin. Um, this can be things like if the crystals themselves aren't, aren't stable at room temperature, or if you want to, for example, cryo trap an intermediate in an enzyme reaction where the half-life is much, much longer at the 100 Kelvin than at room temperature. And I'll show you an example of that in a bit. Um, okay, so yeah, as I said, we can collect data at room or cryo temperatures from hydrogen deuterium exchange or per deuterated crystals. And the crystal volumes typically range from around 0.05 millimeters cubed for small unit cells to around one millimeter cubed if we're looking at very large cells. 
Of course, as I say, that depends on the cell volume, the space group, and the level of deuteration. And again, the same thing applies with how long the data takes to collect. It can take a few hours for a, a very a small cell with a large per deuterated crystal, such as rubridoxin. We can collect that in a few hours. But something very large with a, uh, with a small crystal, a large system with a small crystal can take up to around two weeks. Um, I've just plotted here, um, I keep adding to this when we do new things. This is just to show that with time, we're improving the uh, effectiveness of data collection through the um, use of perjuturation and the advances in the instrumentation so that we can go to smaller crystals and to larger unit cells. So as you can see, we're kind of going in this direction, which is excellent. So just a quick word on the data processing. Um, Lowry diffraction data currently on Ladia processed with using LowryGen, uh, indexed and integrated with LowryGen. Because the intensities are over a wavelength range, we have to wavelength normalize them. And this is done with L scale, which uses symmetry equivalent reflections stimulated at different wavelengths. Uh, and then after that, the data are then processed with basically standard X-ray software from the CCP4 suite. What's more interesting is the structural refinement. Um, nowadays, we use the Phoenix software suite. Um, and with this, it has the ability to refine against neutron data alone, X-ray data alone, or both X-ray and neutron data in a joint X-ray neutron strategy. And that's become more and more popular in the, in the last few years. Um, basically, with neutron crystallography, we can collect the data from the, the crystal, and then we can go and collect X-ray data afterwards from exactly the same crystal. When you combine the data from the two, you increase the data to parameter ratio and the errors with this errors within the data sets are not going to be the same and so this gives you in principle a much more accurate and precise model um this is the program coot which is a molecular visualization visualization program um that shows you the uh, structures in real space which you can manipulate and then put back into phoenix for reciprocal space refinement so what you see here in in green is the uh, electron density for this tyrosine side chain. And in blue, you see the nuclear scattering length density map, which, as you can see, covers the positions and gives you the information on all of the atoms. OK, so um, <clears throat> gladi has been a real success. It's still a world, the world leading instrument for neutron protein crystallography. Um, Used as the smallest crystals, collect the data the fastest collected more data and more structures than any other instrument. Um, um, but we didn't want to rest on our laurels, um, mainly because the, the machine is, the field has been growing and expanding and there's more users. And so over the last few years, the demand for that has been extremely high. The over demand has been high. Um, and so we couldn't um, even do all of these fantastic experiments that we want, that people were proposing, uh, which is a real shame. In fact, the success of LADI has, has been uh, is shown by the fact that in other neutron institutes, such as in uh, Oak Ridge at Haifa and at Munich at FRM2, they have built instruments which are basically close to clones of LADI in terms of using cylindrical detectors. Uh, of course, there are some differences. In fact, the machine in uh, at Munich is a monochromatic instrument, but it uses a cylindrical detector in the same way. While the instrument at Oak Ridge at Haifa is called Imagine, and is very similar to Laddie, um, has a cylindrical detector and uses a quasi Lowry beam. So, um, as part of the endurance program, uh, we put forward a proposal to build a new instrument, a second instrument for neutron macromolecular crystallography to extend the capacity and capability. And this machine is called DALI. Uh, you can see here, this is the uh, cabin uh, for Laddie. And in fact, Dali is on the on a adjacent guide and sits in front in its own air conditioned cabin now. So, so in fact, the, the, you can go into this either from going up these steps. So that's just so you know where it is. Um, so the, the, really, Dali is basically um, a, again a clone of Laddie, except we wanted to, of course, um, try and extend the capabilities. And one of the ways that we can do this is rather than use a multi-layer bandpass filter to select out the wavelengths that we use, we can use a, a, velo a neutron velocity selector, which has a much higher transmission, so we can increase the flux and use smaller crystals. We can also manipulate the bandwidth 
much better with a velocity selector. And as we go to larger unit cells on a fixed radius detector like LADI, um, we start to have real issues with spatial overlaps of, of uh, reflection. So even though we can, the crystal diffracts well and we can collect data, they're spatially overlapped and, and we can't really use these uh, spatially overlapped reflections. So, so in order to study large unit cells, we need to reduce the bandwidth compared to the uh, situation on LADI. The LADI bandwidth, the delta lambda over lambda is around 30%. This is an example of a protein uh, DNA polymerase, which we collected data on LADI. It diffracted, the crystals were nice and big. The crystals diffracted to around 2.5 angstroms, but a huge portion of the actual diffraction was overlapped and so um, couldn't be used. So the idea here, here is that by using a velocity selector with a narrower bandwidth and a higher transmission, we don't have so many issues of overlaps and um, we can use smaller crystals. So here I've just, uh, this is a simulation of the overlaps for this unit cell uh, with a delta lambda over lambda of about 15%. And as you can see in this case, less than 10% of the reflections are overlapped. Whereas with a delta lambda over lambda of 30%, this is much, much more prohibitive. Um, so the commissioning of DALI has been going on during the pandemic and that's been a real challenge to ILL staff, but they've made huge efforts to get this up and running and installed and commissioned as soon as possible, um, which is allowing DALI to be in the user program for the last cycle of this year. In fact, uh, the commissioning is nearly complete and so it's possible that we may be able to do some experiments in the next cycle. So I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone involved. I should say that the uh, scientific project leader for this was my co-responsible Nicola Kirkel and the um, project leader was Stefan Fouad. And these five people have, uh, have contributed hugely to the uh, installation of DALI. Wayne Clancy is the technician, has done a huge amount of work. And Emilio Ruiz and Kevin Olivier from SCI have been um, hard at work getting, getting everything with Nomad and the reading and uh, everything ready for, for, for us to use the instrument. So these are, of course, not the only people. In fact, virtually everyone, I think, at some point at the ILL has probably helped or contributed in some way or another. So that's why I wanted to say a big thank you. So the current status of DALI, um, so the commissioning is close to complete. We had some issues with, as always, with software and, and detector reading, um, background issues that you don't know about until you put the machine in place. So we've been in the process of commissioning the machine and most of these issues are now resolved. One of the things that's outstanding that needs to be still done is the installation of the cryostream, which will be done in April. Um, but we can, in principle, now collect data at room temperature. We have the air-conditioned cabin and everything set up. So the good news is that using the velocity selector, using a velocity selector on DALI as opposed to the uh, multi-layer filter, <clears throat> with the current velocity selector that we have, we have about three times more flux than LADI. Uh, and this, of course, is a huge gain in terms of being able to use smaller crystals, collect the data quicker, go to higher resolution or look at larger unit cells. Um, we've made comparative tests with, with standard crystals between DALI and LADI. And in all cases, the um, data to reduction and refinement statistics in the resolution shells correlate well with this gain. So we're seeing higher I over six. Uh, we're seeing uh, nice R values in the refined structures. Um, However, one of the things that I wanted to point out is that currently we're using the spare SANS NVS, which is not really optimized for exactly for what we want to do. And so the issue at the moment, until we have the new optimized NVS, which has been ordered, is, um, is that we're currently a bit restricted in, in terms of the low the wavelength, spread, um, wavelength range that we can use for data collection. So by tilting the current NVS to its maximum, um, in terms of avoiding anything crashing into each other, we can tilt it by five degrees and this allows us to get to this wave wavelength range here, 3.2 3 to four angstroms, which is, is uh, has a narrow bandwidth than LADI, so that helps with the larger unit cells, but it also, because of this, it restricts us in the maximum uh, uh, resolution that we can we can achieve the res when I'm talking about resolution here. I'm talking about the, the minimum d spacings uh, 
the minute the, the uh, dis the maximum dis the minimum distance that we can resolve in terms of the actual structure. So um, as you can see, you can see that from these statistics where in fact, just this is just the structural refinement statistics. Uh, you can see that there's quite a big drop off around two or 1.9 angstroms where this is just purely because we haven't got enough shorter wavelength neutrons in the band pass currently. Um, again, the width of this NVS is narrower than the multi-layer multi filter band pass, but it's still a rather too wide for the larger unit cells that we'd like to study. But the good news is that the both of these issues will be resolved when, with the arrival of the optimized NVS. Um, this is just some characteristics of, of the optimized NVS that we're ordering. And this is a nice diffraction pattern from the new machine. So um, what will the new instrument allow us to do? Well, it'll, of course, it'll, in principle, it'll be able to allow us to do the same experiments quicker or with smaller crystals. But really, we're more interested in looking at larger unit cells. Um, Currently, we're maybe uh, restricted to cells of around a maximum of 100 angstroms on edge. And a lot of the interesting biological systems have larger unit cells than this. So every, anything we can do to push to study larger unit cells is hugely beneficial for looking at some of the really interesting um, uh, systems that we'd like to study. So I've just thought of three things today that, uh, that we, we, we would like to do. And some of these are actually already uh, underway in terms of growing crystals. So for example, on the left, you see this, uh, this is a protein human acetylcholine esterase. This is uh, catalyzes the breakdown of the neurotransmitter acetylcholine and their targets of uh, no target of inhibition for nerve agents and pesticides. It has a rather large unit cell. Um, and when we tried to collect data, on LADI from these from crystals that were around 0.1. So it's very small crystals for a very large unit cell. Actually, we were really pleased to be able to get data to 3.5 angstroms. But I, if you remember from my talk earlier, we really need to get to more like 2.5 angstroms to be able to start seeing the positions of the deuterium. So this, although this was a fantastic result, the problem was again, that the crystals were really too small for this type of unit cell and there was issues with overlap. So with the new instrument in principle, maybe with the equivalent size crystal or hopefully with something larger, we can push this to, to get to a higher resolution. Um, again, I, I, this is a project, uh, I'd like, there's a lot of transmembrane receptor proteins that are really interesting. This one here is just uh, an archaeoridopsin that Anthony Watts has been, from Oxford has been working on. Um, this actually diffracts really uh, high resolution with x-rays to around one angstrom, but the crystals themselves are really small. And so even though the cell isn't so large in terms of this, this system, uh, the crystal size, the crystal volume is still a challenge. So hopefully with DALI, with the higher flux, this is something we can pursue further. And recently there was a proposal from Anne Hudus from Institut Pasteur uh, to look into uh, myosin proteins that are a superfamily of proteins, they bind actin, they hydrolyze ATP and they transduce force. So they're basically involved in muscle uh, cells and muscle, the, the mechanism behind muscles. So these are also really interesting proteins to look at, but in this case, they have large unit cells. Now we can, the collaborators of mine, they can grow large crystals of this, but the cell at the moment is rather prohibitive. So we hope in the future to be able to do these sort of things on, on daily. How am I doing for time? Um, right, so I just wanted to give you a few examples of things we've done over the, or I've picked a few examples of things we've done over the last few years. Um, uh, I want to mention a few studies uh, regarding lectins, which are sugar binding or carbohydrate binding proteins. They re bind uh, reversibly, uh, they bind the carbohydrates reversibly, and they show extreme specificity towards certain carbohydrates. Um, so PLL is a L-fucose-specific lectin from a certain type of uh, bacteria, P. luminescence, and this lives in a symbiotic relationship with nematodes. Um, this is part of, I should say, this was a collaboration with Anne Imberti from CERMAV, and this is part of the PhD project of Lucas Gajdos, uh, who was supervised by Juliette DeVos and Trevor Forsyth and myself, um, and they've done some fantastic work. So, 
this is a really brief summary because, in fact, one of the key things that Lucas has managed to do was he, he spent a lot of time managing to uh, not only perdutrate the protein, but also to perdutrate or fully deuterate the fucose because the same thing applies. It's a real shame to go to the, the extent of perdutrating your protein, but then if you don't perdutrate the small molecule, then you don't see the details that perhaps you, well, you might not see all the details that you would want to see. So having both fully deuterated is a huge advantage. And Luke has done a fantastic job of uh, achieving that. So this, this is just a quick summary. Um, you managed to grow crystals that were really quite large, around 0.5 millimeters cubed of the, um, of the uh, complex of PLL with fucose. And what we're really interested in is understanding how these sugars bind in the active site. And um, this is important for, uh, so, um, for understanding or developing uh, inhibitors in the future. So what we saw, you can see down here, this is just a little uh, summary of the binding site or a screenshot of this, the binding site where we could see details of the hydrogen bonding between the hydroxyl groups of the fucose. Fucose contains a methyl, a CH3 group, in this case CD3. And so also one of the important interactions other than hydrogen bonding is the, um, is the hydrophobic interactions and the, the, the pi stacking interactions between the sugar and the tryptophan residues in, in, the, in the binding site. Also found information on the water molecules, positions and orientations. Um, and this was just recently published in Structure, very recently, so it hasn't even got a proper reference. Now the work in terms of producing the fully deuterated fucose is in this uh, paper here. This is super complicated biochemistry that I admit I don't fully understand, but um, this is, if for those that are hardcore biologists, they can read this paper. Um, another example of a carbohydrate binding protein is, uh, is this human galactin-3. Um, this, this binds galactose-containing YOTs on glycoproteins. It's involved in cell-to-cell -cell adhesion, cell differentiation, and so it's an important drug target because it's implicated in breast cancer and heart disease. Um, it's naturally binds to lactose, and this study was uh, really a to look into the how the lactose and other molecules, small molecules, bind in the binding site, um, and looking again at the protonation states, the orientations of the hydroxyl groups, um, in order to really understand whether the whether we're going down the right pathway for the design of inhibitors, and it really does confirm that inhibitors based on the disaccharide core. With additional groups, non-sugar groups at the end of the of the sugar disaccharide, is is the way to go forward with increasing um, for the design of inhibitors. Which, um, for example, there is this one TD one three nine, which is at the moment in phase two clinical trials for pulmonary fibrosis. So, this was again a really nice study with Derek Logan um, and uh, Federico Manzoni. Um, who sadly, since it was his PhD study, and he sadly passed away. So um, he, he managed to do some fantastic work, and it's a real tragedy. Anyway, um, this the, one of the main points I wanted to make about this is, of course, we can use smaller and smaller crystals, but if you can grow larger crystals, we can still collect data to higher resolution and to in a quicker time. And so here, uh, they managed to grow a crystal of 1.8 millimeters cubed. Uh, beautiful perjuturated crystal, and that allowed us to collect data to very high resolution. In fact, the diffraction pattern you see here is the one behind me, um, which diffracted to around 1.7 angstroms, and we could collect this whole data set in, in, in less than a week. We had collected earlier data sets for this uh, with much smaller crystals. We had a crystal of 0.35 millimeters cubed, and when we used that, it took us around three weeks to collect the data to around 1.9 angstroms. So this was just, the point here was just to emphasize that the larger the crystals, still the better to, to a certain extent. Um, so they were all ligand binding studies, carbohydrate binding studies. Um, the next side is, is, is more related to enzyme mechanism studies. Um, it's work with Peter Moody and Emma Raven and Hannah Kwan from the UK, from Peter Moody's uh, Leicester University and Emma's now in Bristol. Um, so these, these heme peroxidases 
as the name applies, they're enzymes that in, incorporate a heme group and they carry out a wide range of oxidations using these highly reactive ferrile intermediates. Um, there's been debate for 20 odd years about the actual nature, chemical nature of these two transient intermediates in the, uh, in the pathway. Um, and people have tried various different techniques, including X-ray work and the spectroscopic techniques to try and define or uh, determine the chemical nature of these two intermediates. Um, Peter himself has tried to do this with x-rays, but the problem with that is because you have an iron in the middle of the heme, you have photo reduction with the x-ray beam. So the results that you get, you can never be fully confident are actually correct. So we started a neutron project where this was quite, um, this was a first really. We, we, in the past, we've collected data at, at low temperatures, but this was the first time that anyone had ever initiated a, a reaction in the crystal and then immediately plunged it into the liquid nitrogen or into the cryo stream, gas nitrogen stream, to trap the uh, intermediate state of the protein. So we did this both for the trapping of compound one with cytochrome C peroxidase and also with compound two with ascorbate peroxidase. And this has allowed us to reveal for the first time these, the actual chemical species of these transient intermediates. And that meant that the, uh, because these, these uh, what we found was rather unexpected in terms of the protonation states, but also the chemical nature of these species meant that the classical te textbook mechanism for these heme peroxidases has to be readdressed. Um, more re recently, we've collected data on the ascorbate peroxide complex with its substrate ascorbate. And this allowed us to visualize protons in the proton coupled electron transfer pathway. Uh, and that included to our, again, rather unexpected and a neutral arginine species, which people have spoke about before, but no one had ever, as far as I'm aware, as I'm aware had ever seen before. So this was again, something that was rather unique um, uh, to this study. And because of that, uh, these, the, these, this work has been published in some really nice high impact journals. Um, right, I, don't, I think I'm nearly at the end. Um, so the next um, project that I want to talk about is around the protein transthyretin. Earlier, I mentioned that when proteins mutate or the, or, uh, or the structure is uh, unstable, what, one of the things that can happen is they can dissociate and form amyloid uh, fibrils. And this is in fact the case for this protein. Its, it's function is to carry thyroxine and retinal bind, binding protein in the serum, but it has an, a propensity to dissociate. So even the wild type TTR and various mutants that are naturally uh, occur are very unstable. And so we wanted to look into understanding how, uh, how the, some mutants are stable while others are unstable. So again, we did various uh, structures of wild types and different mutants to look into the, to the hydrogen bonding, comparing the hydrogen bonding networks in the stable and unstable forms. And uh, what we noticed and from our analysis was that there are a certain hydrogen bonds that are lost within certain unstable mutants. And this means that the actual CD loop of this protein shown here, the, the dy molecular dynamics simulation uh, becomes much looser and this helps to or causes the, um, the overall structure to, to dissociate. So again, I'll just quickly summarize. This was again, rather a small crystal uh, uh, for the tafimidis uh, complex, um, but we got beautiful data, perjuterated proteins. And, and again, this was a really nice multidisciplinary um, project with people involved using molecular dynamics and uh, molecular modeling, x-rays, uh, mm -hmm. mass spec, and many things. The HIV I won't talk about because I've mentioned it before and we're perhaps running out of time. I just wanted to mention one thing, which is the last publication that we did, rather than focusing on the drug binding and understanding the differences in drug binding between the clinical inhibitors, we were looking into the uh, catalytic mechanism. And by using this peptomimetic inhibitor that contains a non-hydrolyzable ketomethylene isosteer, that's a mouthful, 
uh, you can, we could determine the tetrahedral intermediate of the enzyme reaction. And for many years, people thought this was a gem diol. And what we've shown here was that, in fact, it's an oxyanion. Um, how, much, how long have I got left? I uh, basically are over time. Oh, OK. Well, um, I think I'll go to my summary then. I'll skip, sorry to Zoe for not mentioning hers. <laughs> I'll, have, I'll have another opportunity. So really just to summarize, I wanted to sh show today that neutron crystallography is the unique, uh, uh, is in a unique position because it allows the positions of hydrogens and protons to be directly visualized at room temperature. And given their important roles, it's a really useful technique for structural biology as it's, and it's able to answer questions that are unattainable by other techniques. So uh, it's a growing field and the new instrument DALI, we hope for, for it extends the capacity and capabilities, well it will, uh, and allowing the use of smaller crystals and the study of larger systems. So with that, I thank you, Helmut. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you mm -hmm. from all of us. Great talk, nice pictures again, but also very good introduction into the field and you high, um, highlighting the new opportunities of this uh, new instrument that we just have commissioned. Yeah. So uh, Mark is with me, helping me. Uh, if you want to talk, um, well, just raise your hand and we will try to uh, give you the word. So I have already given the word to Arno, if you want to say something, Arno. Yeah, okay. Thank you for your really nice talk. Um, uh, sorry, I have a really small question, technical question. Uh, regarding uh, the DALI instrument, I just I was just wondering. So you will be able to use smaller crystals uh, with DALI, but how does it compare when you mean smaller with X-ray? Okay. Uh, <laughs> okay, we're we're always going to be in a position where we need much larger crystals than X-rays. Um, uh, of course, the, the smaller a crystal that we need, the more, in principle, easy it is to grow. Uh, and the bottleneck in the past was always that it was a huge challenge to grow uh, multi-millimeter cube crystals. So this, however much smaller the crystals are for Dali than they are for Ladi, will still help open up more possibilities of different projects to, to, to be able to study. Nevertheless, when we talk about the sizes, so when I say that a crystal is 0.1 millimeters cubed, it's still around 300 microns on edge, if my maths is right, or approximately right. And this is still an order, well, probably two orders of magnitude larger than X-ray X -ray crystals. In fact, because of synchrotrons being so highly intense and because of the development of x fells the let's say the art of growing large crystals in the field of X-ray crystallography has kind of waned over the years. So people can use much, much smaller crystals than they, they did in the past. And so the efforts made into crystallogenesis is kind of not so uh, crucial for them anymore. Um, so we're always gonna need large crystals. Uh, it's one of the reasons why we need to develop uh, instrumentation platforms for large crystal growth. but um yeah the, the the real key for us is that however even if it's uh only a, a tiny bit smaller uh, it's, it still means a big difference in, in in whether you're able to get a crystal that size or not so does that answer yeah. the question yeah, well, yeah. That's interesting great. also uh, uh because i remember that graph that i think mark has shown several times where there was this Gaussian distribution of the X-ray crystal uh, sizes. And we thought, wow, if we get only a little bit smaller, then we get into the upper region of, of that Gaussian, mm -hmm. which is still thousands of structures, right? Absolutely. So if naturally now the efforts of that community dwindle away to, to go for anything larger than a micrometer on edge, then this is becoming a moving target. And, but, but that really means that the efforts also Trevor championed for a long time of growing crystals is, 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 is absolutely essential. And what does it mean for interacting with our user community? Because basically we would, we would need crystal growers, right? Among those biochemists that are interested in the subjects we are dealing here with. And, and, and what can we do there to, to get out of this 
situation? Actually, um, just to say, I mean, I, yeah, I remember the plot and uh, I think Matthew Bowler from ESRF, he did a nice plot of all of this because he, he's able to measure the crystals that, he, that have been collected on, um, on massive, um, the, these automated beamline that he runs. And um, there are still plenty of projects which actually had crystals that were large enough that, that were large crystals that we could have done neutron studies with. So sometimes people just have large crystals just is the way it is, but they don't need to, to the same extent, let's say. But you're right, even any small, um, small gains in terms of reduction in volume brings in to, 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 uh, into target many, many, many more structures and, uh, and structures that are biologically interesting. So, so a gain of three from Ladi to Dali is, is already a huge thing for being able to grow crystals that are, let's say, uh, 200 microns on edges that are 300 microns. It might not sound like a big difference, but it is, in fact. Mark, you raised your hand. Yeah, um, thanks, Matthew. That was, uh, as usual, a really nice talk. And uh, with the ribbons and so on, they're very nice pictures. Um, on the instrumentation side, I think we were all very pleased to discover a quick win with the velocity selector. It was something that we hadn't, uh, you know, looked at for, for, for Laddie, but it was natural to look at it for Dali and, and it works so well. It's, uh, it's great. So we've ordered the optimal velocity selector for Dali and we'll do the same for Laddie. But I just wonder in the short term, would you be tempted to install a, the, a SANS velocity selector for, for Laddie uh, instead of the uh, filter that you've currently got? Or would that be too restrictive for you? Um, it, it, I've spoke to Benjamin Giroux a bit about what civil engineering would be required to put the uh, velocity selector in place instead of the, using the filter on Laddie. And it's not a huge, but uh, I, I can't say more than that. It's not a huge amount of effort, but yeah, I mean, the the the, the issue is it's great that the velocity selectors have a gain in transmission, and that's fantastic. But we would still need a velocity selector that allows us to collect to high enough resolution. So it depends on the characteristics of the velocity selector. I mean, to be honest, the velocity selector that is on on Dali at the moment for large unit cells, uh, large unit cells which you know, the larger the unit cell, the high, the lower the resolution. <laughs> generally, the larger the, the the larger the unit cell, the less, the more weak the the, the diffraction is. Um, and so, collecting data sets to around 1.9 to angstrom is not the end of the world for now. But of course, it's a tragedy if you have crystals that are larger that you can't that you're limited by the wavelength range for collecting to higher resolutions. So um, it depends on the characteristics of the MVS of whether we would do that immediately on Laddie, let's say. Um, it's such a modest investment that we should do it uh, as soon as we can anyway. You know, it's a few, a couple of hundred thousand, so which is uh, by instrumentation standards, very modest. Uh, and, and when we can do that, we, I'm sure we will. Um, but it was uh, the the gains in in, in flux really are, are worth having straight away if if they can be used. So yeah, actually, I mean, when when Laddie was relocated from the old guide position to the new guide, and Ken Anderson was at the ILL, and and we did speak about originally spoke about incorporating a velocity selector then, um, and at the time, then he left to go to the ESS. Now at Oak Ridge. And um, so at the time we felt that the, the, uh, we would just um, continue with what we were using in the past, partly because the papers for the multi-layer filters say their reflectivity is around 70%. Mm. But in fact, from the experiments we've done, we discovered it's actually much lower. Mm. Um, and uh, at Pierre, I must say Pierre Courtois has helped me a lot with understanding the filters and he, he's built a new second one for me so that I could then measure the reflectivity and, and find these things out properly because we were kind of reverse engineering from old papers to try and understand what 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 was really the situation. So thank you. Bunny, you wanted to ask a question? 
Yeah, thanks. Very impressive talk. I was just wondering, so you mentioned that uh, you can treat the data together X-ray and neutron uh, diffraction. And I was wondering if uh, complement, other complementary information like from an NMR could uh, allow to reduce the crystal size that you needed. So as much more uh, complementary information you feed in, you might be able to work on smaller crystals. Is there a potential there? Um. Yeah, I mean, if we can combine the information, you know, in it, then the more information from different techniques in principle, the better. Um, I don't know if it will have any effect on the size of the crystals, but it would have an in, perhaps have an improvement on the uh, the resulting structures and models that we, we end up with. So I don't know so much about whether the... Uh, about the details of that, but for example, there are developments in, in 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 the structural refinements where they're doing quantum refinements and using MM, QM, and all these sort of things in combination. That's becoming much more common. So, so yeah, really, in the end, the more complementarity and the more te techniques, the better, I would say. But um, in terms of the crystal size, we you know it's it's really determined by the flux on the on the instrument. So. Um, or the efficiency of the detector perhaps as well. So yeah, so um, in general, it's been small iterative developments that have led to us getting overall quite big gains. So if you go back to the original LADI um, compared to LADI now, the LADI 3 as it's called, there's more than, you know, small things altogether gained as more than an order of magnitude. So that, that really was the tipping point for success to the majority of experiments instead of the failure of most experiments. And I hope that DALI will tip that even more in the way of using smaller crystals and looking at larger systems. So Thank you very much. I'm pressing a little bit. Astrid, you have the privilege of asking the last question to uh, Matthew. Then I, fortunately we have to go on with our business in the scientific council. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I have a short question. Is, is there any agreement about the metadata that you can, can load the data for, from, from different facilities uh, and different methods for your Phoenix software? Um, I mean, we Nomad stores all the no metadata okay. mm -hmm. from the experiments. Um, in fact, there, yeah, it, as you probably know, at the moment, there's a big push to to proper archiving and of not only the data, the raw data, but the metadata as well, so that things can be re-looked at when software improves with time and to have open access to, uh, to the data for more people. So that's something that in the neutron world, we've actually been really good at. I think, I believe we've stored all the neutron data at the ILL since the late seventies. Um, of course, the amount or size of the data is a bit different to a synchrotron, but they, they've been doing that now for a year or two, I think, Mark, I'm not sure, something like this. Um, uh, and yeah, and I think it's a good idea. I mean, but you need, you're absolutely right, you absolutely need the metadata to be able to know what people did with the experiment rather than just the raw data itself. Uh, and I think it, there's discussions of file formats and things like this, of headers and having all the correct information. I mean. Even I will, yeah. Thank you so much. I will come back to you about that in, yeah. in detail. So that's, that's a very interesting thing. And, and I think it's very important. Mm. So thank you. So that's a good final word. Um, I think everybody was excited by your presentation, uh, Matthew. So thank you very much. See you in six years then with uh, an <laughs> update. And